If you were to ask anyone clued up on Islamic history to make a list of the most significant Muslim generals of the past, then Tariq ibn Ziyad would be amongst the names that would be expected to feature in most people's lists, for he is usually the one credited for the foundation of Al-Andalus. But what is Al-Andalus and what role did Tariq ibn Ziyad have in its conquest? In this video, we will summarize the Islamic conquest of the Iberian Peninsula. However, before we start, please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. It would really help the channel. Jazakallahu khairan. First, a little background. The gate for Islam was opened for the Berbers throughout the Islamic conquests of Al Maghrib, a series of events that took place between 647 to 709 Common Era which actually initially began under the Rashidun Caliphate era and their conversion to Islam would serve the Ummah well. This is emphasized by the historian David Nicole, who refers to the Berbers' services to Ummah as of great military significance, especially for the Umayyad era, in which a large number of Berbers would be made governors in North Africa. This is supported by Andrew Marshall, who refers to their conversion and rate at which they were enrolled as an act that is unparalleled in comparison to anything else up to this point in time. In fact, according to the Muslim historian Izati, the recently converted Berber warriors had become as dedicated in spreading Islam as anybody else, if not more, at least for the time. For they had been recent converts and were therefore more determined to prove themselves. Of the significant governors who benefited from the Berbers' military might and fresh zeal was one Musa ibn Nusayr. In my opinion, it would be impossible to narrate the conquest of Iberia without mentioning this individual, for he had been Tariq ibn Ziyad's senior in military ranking and had a significant role in its conquest. Musa ibn Nusayr had been the Amuid governor of Afriqiya at the time. A very competent military general himself, Musa used the Berbers to expand on the caliphate's territory in North Africa. The historian Alexander Bigabertzi believes that Musa had been a Berber himself, but this is disputed. For example, Kordani et al. refers to him as impeccably Arab. Despite his success, he had a rocky relationship with the caliphate. He was originally forced out of Iraq under controversy, and it seemed that suspicion would remain around him until the end of his life. However, he had enough trust from the then Caliph and ally Al-Walid to allow him to go for the Iberian Peninsula, which is essentially mostly modern-day Spain and Portugal. The circumstances of how this came to be is disputed. What we know for sure, however, was that the Iberian Peninsula had been divided and that King Roderick, one of the rulers of Hispania, had not been very popular. In fact, according to one account, the Christian Count Julian had contacted the Muslims and called upon them to invade. Some suggest that he had been looking for a new ally. But there had also been the claims that he had done so after learning that King Roderick had taken advantage of his daughter. This latter account is found in the works of Ibn Qutayya and is also supported by the British historian Stanley Lane Poole. At any rate, when Musa decided to invade, he called upon his greatest lieutenant for the job, and that had been Tariq ibn Ziyad. Tariq ibn Ziyad had been the greatest of the Berber warriors and one of the finest generals of his generation. His talents were noticed and Musa made Tariq the governor of Tangier, which is in modern day Morocco. Now here is where it gets interesting, according to one version of the events, it had actually been Tariq ibn Ziyad's idea to invade the Iberian Peninsula. According to this narrative, Julian had in fact contacted Tariq ibn Ziyad first, who upon learning of the opportunity to expand into Spain, contacted Musa ibn Nusayr so that he could get his approval. Anyway, in 711 common era, with the help of Julian, 
Tara crossed into Spanish waters from North Africa with a force around 7,000. Interestingly, according to one source, whilst on board of one of those ships, Tariq fell asleep and he dreamt of the Prophet peace be upon him and the Sahaba. It is then said that when Tariq woke up, he took it as a ru'ya from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and felt even more confident in his mission. And Allahu alam, he would embark on what we now know as Gibraltar. Now, I'm going to pause here for a moment to give you a little trivia. Gibraltar had been known in the Roman era as the Pillars of Hercules or Mons Calpe, but after its Islamic conquest, it would be changed to Gibraltar, which is essentially the Latinized from the Arabic Jebel Tariq, which literally means the mountain or Mount of Tariq, hence the mountain of Tariq ibn Ziyad. Sometime after his arrival, Tariq ibn Ziyad incited his famous speech that has been so commonly attributed to him. According to the version provided by Al-Maqari, it goes like this. O oh my people, whither would you flee? Behind you is the sea, before you the enemy. Your enemy is before you, protected by innumerable army. He has men in abundance, but you, as your only aid, have your swords, and as such is your only chance of life. What was read out to you just now was not the full version but snippets. Essentially, Tariq ibn Ziyad was telling his men that there was no turning back. However, if we were to believe the version narrated by the 13th century historian Ibn Karadabos, he went one step further by ordering the ships and the boat in which they used to arrive in to be burnt. This was supposedly a drastic deterrent to prevent anyone from fleeing. When Roderick learned of Tariq's arrival, he turned to his rivals, the sons of Batitha, for support. However, unknowingly to him, they had already allied with Tariq in secret, in exchange for maintaining their own territory once the Muslims took Iberia. In fact, Tariq had the agreement certified by the Amoid Caliph, which stipulated that they, and here he is referring to the sons of Atitha, shall never have to rise to anyone who approaches them, nor to anyone who takes leave of them. Essentially, stating that the sons of Atitha are to remain in charge of their own realms unopposed. Tariq ibn Ziyad and Roderick's forces would confront each other at the Battle of Guatalate in 711 Common Era, and according to Ibn Qutayyah, during Ramadan. Tariq ibn Ziyad's army would crush Roderick's, and Roderick would be killed in battle. According to one version, upon sensing defeat, Roderick killed himself by throwing himself into the river. This victory would prove to be decisive, for it would open up the Iberian Peninsula for the Muslims. Tariq ibn Ziyad would go on to take Toledo, which had been the capital of the territory under Roderick, and one of his other units under his captain Mughet al-Rumi would go on to capture Cordoba. When Musa ibn Nusayr learned of Tariq's stunning success, he decided that he should also take part in the action. However, he would not choose the path that Tariq ibn Ziyad had already carved out. According to Ibn Qutayya, Musa may have actually become jealous of Tariq, and perhaps he wanted to create a legacy of his own. And Allahu alam. In 712 Common Era, he would cross the Straits of Gibraltar and capture Medina Sidiona, Sevilla, Mertola, amongst other locations. And by 715 Common Era, virtually all of southern Iberia would be under the control of the Muslims. Like Tariq ibn Ziyad, Musa would also have a mount named after him. Jabal Musa, which is located in modern-day Morocco and is essentially in the African side of the Strait of Gibraltar. Things would suddenly change quite drastically for the both of them, however. After the death of the Caliph al-Walid, his successor, Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik, would arrest Musa on accusation, and the two would spend the rest of their lives in Syria. Musa's son, Abdullah Aziz ibn Musa, 
who had been put in charge of Sevilla and according to some was the first governor of Al Andalus was assassinated shortly after which could suggest a conspiracy in which the caliph may have feared Musa's growing influence. However, it's not really clear what happened to either of them once they entered Damascus. Musa died approximately one year later, with Ibn Qutiyah claiming that Musa was imprisoned and then murdered. But again, this is disputed. As for Tariq, his face is even more obscure, for no one knows what became of him, other than that the general consensus believed that he died around 720 common era. It is interesting because although Tariq and Musa did not have the opportunity to properly reign after their conquest, their actions cemented their legendary status in Islamic history. The Muslims would go on to take more territory in modern day Spain and Portugal and they would form what has been referred to as Al-Andalus. Ironically, after the Abbasids defeated the Amoids at the Battle of Zab, in 750 common era, the surviving Amoid family members fled to Al-Andalus, the very land which Tariq ibn Ziyad and Musa founded, which is ironic because of how both men were treated by Caliph Suleiman after their conquest. Finally, for those who don't know, Cordoba would proclaim its own caliphate in 929 common era, and Al-Andalus would remain a Sunni powerhouse up until 1492 common era. Essentially, the power founded by Tariq and Musa would last for more than 700 years. If you like this video, please remember to like, share and subscribe as this does help the channel. While you're at it, you might want to check out some of the other videos we have on this channel and please let us know in the comment sections of other topics you'd like to see covered on the channel. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته